This is a very big question for us to contemplate and this afternoon is really just a taster to help us think for ourselves and to look into these matters for ourselves to see why should I believe in a God I cannot see and hopefully it will give you some incentive to go away and actually look into these things for yourself. So it's not an in-depth study of any part but an overview of why should I believe in a God I cannot see. Now there is no elephant there, you cannot see it. Okay, You'll see what I mean by that later on. You have to pretend it's not there. Let us put our Bibles just briefly to one side for a few moments and let's take the position of the atheist or the evolutionist who doesn't believe that there is a God or that the Bible is the Word of God. What are our options? Where would we turn for answers to our very existence here in this world? And what does the future hold for us? When we look around us day by day as we go about our lives and see and hear and experience the world that we live in, do we really think that it is all pure chance? We see many wonders of nature, of life, and perhaps we take it for granted. Perhaps we take it for granted that we live in these marvelous bodies, we walk around in them every day. Do we think about how they're constrict constructed and how they work? the complexities of our bodies. On the other hand, when we walk around day by day, we cannot deny the problems that we see in the world and hear about in the world. And we obviously understand the frailty of our lives, the certainty that life at some point will end, whether that is through illness, whether it's through accident or old age. It's going to happen. And unfortunately, the world left to its own devices looks bleak, doesn't it? Doctors, scientists, politicians, all thinking that they've got answers to the world's problems. We've got global warming, climate change, very much in our news at the moment. We have disease, we have poverty, there are still famines, we have plenty of wars, and the current biggest worry, terrorism. And it affects people's lives, doesn't it? Every day, men, women and children are in fear for their lives around this world. They have no security in what the future holds for them. So if the doctors, scientists and the governments of this world don't have the answers to solve all these problems, where do we turn for a solution to a future without a God? If there is a God that exists, then surely there must be a solution to all these problems and a future for this planet. And our aim today is to consider briefly the God that is revealed in the Bible. So why then should I believe in a God I cannot see? I'm sure like me you've heard the phrase seeing is believing. And it is in our human nature isn't it? To only want to believe in the things that we can see that we can experience and touch for ourselves and to doubt the things that we cannot see or cannot comprehend. So many people reason that if we can't see God then he can't exist. Do you believe the earth is a globe? Have you seen it? I've never been further than France. I certainly haven't been into outer space. So I've never seen a globe, or the globe. Many ancient cultures, such as the early Egyptians, believed in a flat earth for many hundreds of years. They sometimes believed in a round earth as well. They philosophized over that. And even as late as in the 19th century, we have writers who write about a flat earth. And even today I was surprised to find 
that there are those who believe in a flat earth and it's called the flat earth society I was quite amazed are we deluded for thinking that the earth is a round globe and it spins on an axis travelling around the sun we haven't seen it for ourselves we certainly haven't been to space and yet I'm sure you believe that you live on a globe just like, like I do and we'll follow up the reason for that in a little while there are many in the world who would have us believe that our lives are everything we have around us has come by chance that to believe in a God means we are deluded that's how they see us in the face of such opposition it can be very difficult can't it for us to accept that there is a God and that the Bible is his word that has been recorded for us you often hear people say don't you you only have one life live it or it's your life enjoy it and these are the messages of people around us that's what they want to believe they have no time for a God the purpose in their lives is to get the most out of what out of it as they can while they are still alive after all you only get one chance is what they say and our lives are constantly bombarded with these messages we grow up with it don't we whether that's through our friends at school the media or any other means and it's a very subtle message they give us but also very prominent it's about our rights and how we should be exercising them our lives on our planet without a God because that's how many people view the earth as belonging to them they are not interested and they don't have the time to believe in a God you might have seen and heard about the adverts that were on sides of buses a short while back where they said there's probably no God now stop worrying and enjoy life and you can get stationary with slogans that say keep calm there is no God and that is the society that we live in however it's not a modern problem and the Bible speaks of such people I know there are many people who question the authority of the Bible but we'll look at that in a moment for now let's just read some verses from the time of David the psalmist and from the time of the flood so first of all this one all these quotes by the way are from the New American Standard Bible for the wicked boasts of his heart's desire and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord the wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him all his thoughts are there is no God and then in Psalm 14 verse 1 we read the fool has said in his heart there is no God and this is what David's observance was of those who lived in his life around him at that time and he lived about 3,000 years ago in Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 and 6 we read then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the, th of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart the reason God brought about a flood on the earth approximately 4,350 years ago was because mankind had turned from trusting in him. Their purposes and their desires were turned to enjoying life without a God. They had rejected God, just as many people today have rejected God. Can you imagine the ridicule that Noah would have faced at the time of the building of the ark? when he told them what they he was doing would they have considered him deluded by believing in a God and building the ark so we can see it's not just a modern day problem is it so do we try to understand then the explanations about how we got here using theories devised by human beings the theory of evolution the reasoning of mankind and just enjoy our lives carrying on with our lives regardless of why we are here and then accept that at the end of our short lives there's just nothing more maybe just the next generation to carry on our name and our memories or rather than accepting the opinion of men and women 
doubting whether God exists and ridiculing those who do believe, do we approach this with an open mind and examine some reasons rationally for ourselves as to why we should believe in a God that we cannot see? Although we cannot see God, if we take the stop time to stop and consider the world around us, we will discover that there is a lot of evidence that indicates that there must be a greater power at work in the universe. An evidence that demonstrates clearly that we are not here purely by chance. We're going to be looking at the world that we live in, how cells and DNA work, and having a look at the knee joint. Now in no way can we in half an hour go into these in any depth. This is just an overview to make us think. Just reflect briefly for a moment. In very basic logical terms, the planet Earth that we live on. An approach with an open, logical, reasoning mind is this random chance or is it evidence of a designer at work? The beauty that we find in nature. We have a planet that has an atmosphere that is able to sustain and protect life. We have trees and plants that absorb carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. And we have plenty of evidence, don't we? Photographs and things of all of these things in nature that show these things happening. Let's just consider the next slide. We live on a planet that is exactly the right distance from the sun. Any closer would be too hot for life. Any further away would be too cold. The air that we breathe, even though we cannot see it, that's in front of us now in this room and that we are breathing, has the right mixture of gases. Any other proportions or traces of gases or changes in gases would be no good for life. We have the balance of the atmosphere maintained by plants, producing oxygen until mankind interferes with the vegetation and end up destroying forests. And without this level of oxygen in the atmosphere, there would be no ozone because ozone is a form of oxygen. An ultraviolet light and ultraviolet radiation would destroy life. So these are just some basic facts for us to consider. We could keep expanding the list, showing how ecosystems interact, global temperature control through the oceans and the atmosphere. So is this all pure chance? We can see very many evidences of photos and films, can't we? Showing the wonders and the beauty of the place places and animals from around the world. Just ask yourself when you next look at these things, is it chance? Let us think now about our own bodies and examine some evidence of what we consist of. We live in a time of great medical and scientific advancement, so we are beginning to understand much more about how we function and how we are constructed. We are made up of many millions of cells and each cell has a different purpose. I'd like to introduce this book to you. This is a very fascinating book. It's not in place of the Bible, but it has many quotes from scientists, and it's called, In the Beginning, Compelling Evidence for Creation and the Flood. And this was written by somebody called Walt Brown. And on the back it says, For much of his life, Walt Brown was an evolutionist. But after much study, he became convinced of the scientific validity of creation. And we have many, many quotes contained in here from scientists who were evolutionists, are evolutionists, but back up the theory of creation, or the fact that there must have been a creation rather than evolution. Let's just read some things that he says. I'll just quote these. If despite virtually impossible odds, proteins arose by chance processes, there is not the remotest reason to believe they could 
ever form a membrane, membrane encased, self reproducing, self repairing, metabolizing living cell. There is no evidence that any stable state exists between the assumed formation of proteins and the formation of the first living cells. No scientist has ever demonstrated that this fantastic jump in complexity could have happened even if in the entire universe had been filled with proteins. I'll go on to that one in a moment. He also says that living cells contain thousands of different chemicals, some acidic, others basic, and many chemicals would react with others were it not for some intricate system of chemical barriers and buffers. And if things evolved, these barriers and buffers must also have evolved, but at just the right time to prevent harmful chemical reactions. And he asks the question, how could such precise, seemingly coordinated, virtually miraculous events have happened for each of millions of species? And there are many more things I could quote from that book. And that's just somebody's observance who was an evolutionist and changed his mind because of the evidence before him. Now I'm not a scientist, but I can understand what this scientist is saying and ha understand his explanation and reasoning. So we find design, evidence of design in living cells, something that we hear a great deal about, don't we, with DNA these days, when they're comparing things and evolutionists say that chimpanzees are very close in DNA to us. But actually it's been shown now that there's a huge chasm in the DNA of a chimpanzee and human beings and in no way could they be linked together. And they are discovering more and more, aren't they? Realising that perhaps the more they discover, the less they know about the creation of cells and the complexities of life. I just want to read a conversation that was taken from the biologist in December 2000 and this conversation is in this book about an interviewer called Sam who sorry a writer who interviewed Sam a molecular biologist and Jaws asked Sam about his work Sam said he and his team were scientific detectives working with DNA and tracking down the cause of disease. Here is their published conversation. Sounds like pretty complicated work. You can't imagine how complicated. Try me. I'm a bit like an editor trying to find a spelling mistake inside a, lo a large document. Larger than four complete sets of Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica. 70 volumes, thousands and thousands of pages of small print words. With the computer power, you can just spell, use spell check, can't you? There is no spell check because we don't know yet how the words are supposed to be spelled. We don't even know sh for sure what language. And it's not just the spelling, er spelling errors we're looking for. If any other punctuation is out of place or a space out of place or a grammatical error, we have a mutation that will cause a disease. So how do you do it? We are learning as we go. We have already read over two articles in, the, in that encyclopedia and lo located some typos. It should get easier as time goes by. How did all that information get there? Do you mean, did it just happen? Did it evolve? Bingo. Do you believe that the information evolved? George, nobody I know in my profession truly believes it evolved. It was engineered by genius beyond genius, and such information could not have been written any other way. The paper and ink did not write the book. Knowing what we know, it is ridiculous to think otherwise. A bit like, he carries on, Neil Armstrong believing the moon is made of cheese and he's been there. This conversation carries on. Have you ever stated that in a public lecture, ha, sorry, have you ever stated that in a public lecture or in any public writings? No, it all just evolved. What? 
you just told me. Now just stop right there. To be a molecular biologist requires one to hold on to two insanities at all times. One, it would be insane to believe in evolution when you can see the truth for yourself. Two, it would be insane to say you don't believe in evolution. All government work, research grants, papers, big college lectures, everything would stop. I'd be out of a job or relegated to the outer fringes where I couldn't earn a decent living. I hate to say it, Sam, but that sounds intellectually dishonest. The work I do in genetic research is honourable. We will find the cures to many of mankind's worst diseases, but in the meantime we have to live with the elephant in the living room. What elephant? Design. It's like the elephant in the living room. It moves around, takes up enormous and an enormous amount of space, loudly trumpets, bumps into things, knocks things over, eats a ton of hay and smells like an elephant, and yet we have to swear it isn't there. Now our elephant isn't that big and it doesn't get in the way. But would we swear that that elephant isn't there? You have to, to be an evolutionist. So that's just some of the quotes that we come across in that book, which is one that you can have a look at. The evidence then of design can be seen by scientists. In the living cells of our bodies, in the information contained in the DNA, but they are forced to deny such in order to satisfy the reluctance of men and women to accept there must be a greater power at work, a superior, a superior designer. We can also look at the complexity of design which indicates intellectual design. Just consider very briefly the knee joints that we each have. I think we've all got two knee joints, yes? And we have very powerful evidence of design right in front of us. I'm no doctor, but I can appreciate the evidence of design in an object. This is another interesting book called Hallmarks of Design, Evidence of Purposeful Design and Beauty in Nature. And it addresses a number of topics which are very interesting to read. I'm just going to very briefly summarize what they say about the knee. The knee apparently is an example of a mechanical joint that needs to have several parts that are simultaneously present in order to function. An example of a mechanism that cannot be simplified. It has to be complete to work. And this is a joint that perhaps we take for granted. It isn't just a simple hinge, but it is a very sophisticated piece of design, and many animals also have similarities in their structures and joints. The special shape of the bones, having two concave grooves matching the shape of the femur bone, and that provides movement needed by the joint. And these are held together by two cruciate ligaments, which are kept taut by the rolling action of the bones, and these are vital for guiding the knee joint. The four complex parts all depend on each other being present. If one part of the knee joint has evolved before another, it would not be functional. This can be confirmed if someone snaps a ligament in their knee in an injury. The knee becomes a totally useless joint and it can only be repaired with surgery. If the bones were not of that particular shape, and the ligaments were not in the correct, the correct length or attached to the correct points on the bones, the knee would still not function and it would still be totally useless. And it would be totally useless and it was, unless it was complete. And just think for a moment, all this information is stored in the cells specific to creating a knee joint. And that is stored in an embryo, in the womb, before the joint is even formed. The information is there. And in fact, the information is there for all parts of the body. The brain, the organ, the eyes, the list can go on, can't it? And looking at any of these complex designs would produce similar evidence of intellectual design. So far then, 
we have very briefly considered the planet Earth, the correct set of conditions we have for life, the cells and the DNA, the amount of information contained, and the knee joint. An example of complex design which would not work if it wasn't all complete and simultaneously present. So it couldn't have been a process of evolution. We have a dilemma. If we do not believe that a God exists, then why should we believe that the Bible is the word of God that we cannot see? If we do believe, or sorry, if we do not believe that a God exists, why then should we believe in the Bible as the word of a God that we cannot see? Christadelphians believe that God exists. Even though no one has and no one can see God, we also believe that the Bible is the word of God. But how do we come to that conclusion? There have been many, all down through the ages, that have believed and trusted in the God that is revealed in the Bible as a result of studying it and coming to a conclusion from it. But why? It is because we have real evidence to support that we can believe in the God of the Bible even if we cannot see him. So we're going to very briefly again now look at some evidences that we can find in the Bible. Sorry if you can't read the red um, writing. We can find predictions given by the prophets contained in the Bible. Information about health and welfare. Standards, how to live morally and how that is important. And we can see examples of information of design. We will take a reading now uh, from Daniel chapter 2 and we're going to be reading those verses on the bottom 1 to 3 and 19 to 47. So we're going to read from Daniel chapter 2, first three verses, and then skip over to verse 19. Daniel chapter 2. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. And now verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to king, the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. 
And as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, and worshipped Daniel, and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odours unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing that thou couldst reveal this secret. Thank you, Andrew. So this was a prediction, a prophecy written in approximately 600 BC by Daniel before any of these events took place or before they will take place the internal evidence within the book of Daniel shows that he knew all about life in the court at Babylon and at the Persian times something that a later writer could not have known and this has been confirmed by excavations the ruins of the ancient city of Babylon are still there in present day Iraq. You might have heard of the Ishtar gates that they discovered the foundations of. So this is a very brief overview, simplified just to keep it simple for us to understand what we have just read. We have read of this image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about and Daniel through God's power had been given the information to answer Nebuchadnezzar the first prediction that Daniel makes in the interpretation of the dream that we've just read about was that the Babylonian Empire which is what Nebuchadnezzar was king of he was the head of gold he would be conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire. Verses 36 to 
chapter 39 that we've just read. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. Notice it is God who is in control. It isn't Nebuchadnezzar. And this, what happened with the Medo-Persia, happened in approximately 540 BC. And we can see this from our history books. The second prediction after that, Daniel predicts that there would be another kingdom. And verse 39, after you there will rise another kingdom inferior to you, that was the Medo-Persia, and then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. And that was the Greek Empire, which took over from the Medo-Persian in BC 331 through to 63 BC. You've probably heard about the very famous Greek army general, Alexander the Great, who defeated the Persian army in 331 BC. The next prediction that we read about is in verse 40, a fourth kingdom. And we know from history that from about 150 BC, the Roman power was increasing in strength and started to encroach upon the Greek empire until it finally conquered it in about 63 BC. The Roman Empire ended up splitting up in AD 395 into the east and the west part and lasted until about AD 500 after which there was no more superpower but a kingdom split and divided into smaller nations resulting up to today in our modern times of the modern nations of Europe. So here we have a prophecy contained in the book of Daniel. Daniel who lived in Babylon about 2,600 years ago under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar predicting that after Nebuchadnezzar there would be three more superpowers and each one would replace the previous one. And then after that the kingdoms of men would be divided until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read of that, didn't we? A stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands. And this is when God will set up his kingdom on this earth. So that is a prediction which hasn't happened yet. And that's something for the future. Now we can look back through history to see that history confirms the prophecy that Daniel gave right up to today. But we also have prophecy which has yet to be fulfilled in the future. We haven't got into great detail here. We've only quickly covered the basic overview of this prophecy, but it requires careful and in-depth study and a consideration of the whole book of Daniel and in the light of the rest of the word of God to appreciate its full significance. Why then should we believe that the Bible is the word of God? A word of a God that we cannot see. I think it's reasonable and logical to accept that this is evidence which can be supported by history. Could these predictions be so accurate, accurately described otherwise? Accurately described in advance? And if you think about this carefully, it leaves us with two options. Either it is the word of God or it has come from man. If the Bible is to have any authority at all for men and women to take heed of and obey, then it would have to be the inspired word of God, wouldn't it? Do we trust in the word of God or do we trust in man? We can read in Second Peter chapter 1, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And then in Second Timothy we read, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, 
for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work inspired here means divinely breathed in other words God caused his word to be spoken by men and for it to be recorded so what we have read in Daniel was God's word God's word caused to be written so that men and women can receive the message that God gives us and although the Bible has many writers from all kinds of different backgrounds and it's over a period of 1,500 years the Bible has one author giving us a consistent message throughout there are no contradictions if we study it carefully accurate predictions are fulfilled and proven and they are a powerful evidence of a power greater than us at work if we examine the evidence for ourselves our conclusion will certainly lead us to a realization that there must be a God without the Bible if we take this away we have nothing to go on at all except speculation from those who are only human and are just guessing at possibilities and probabilities of how we and why we exist today therefore I suggest we are not here merely by chance but everything we see in the world is by design of some superior authority and power that is a God the God who created the world we have those words don't we recorded for us in the very first verse of the Bible in the, God, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and so from the very beginning of the Bible and right throughout the whole of the scriptures you will find that there are references to God and that they are abundant references to his design and his purpose with this planet <coughs> if we don't believe in creation or that God exists it leaves us with only one alternative to discount the supreme authority of the design and to say that it all came about by chance life on earth is only possible because of complete harmony between the sunlight, water, air, elements, temperature all the things needed to sustain life did this all come about by chance? well we have a choice many would have us believe that came a life but that life came about by chance or evolution and the theory of evolution requires us to believe that the complex intricate forms of life and the balance of nature and the universe in which we live have developed without purpose accidentally if we do believe in God then we see design in all aspects of life there is no need to try to form theories to explain why we are here because it has been made that way and we have everything that clearly explained in the Bible the word of God right from the beginning of creation which can we believe life had to come from somewhere didn't it are we deluded for thinking that the earth is a round globe going back to that question that we started with that it spins on its axis and traveling around the sun we haven't seen it for ourselves from space but we believe we live on a globe why do we believe because we have evidence we know about all those things satellites photographs we observe how the world works we can travel the world we see planes and ships traveling around and circling the earth and we believe that because there is evidence for us to believe it even if we haven't seen it for ourselves <coughs> we may not be able to see some things but it is because we can see evidence and proof of the existence of those things we are able to reason and conclude from the evidence we see that they exist so there is an elephant in the room isn't there we're not denying it we shouldn't deny the evidence that we see the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the Romans for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes his eternal power 
and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Why is it important for us to believe then in a God I cannot see? Because God has put in his creation and in his word evidence of his supreme authority that can be clearly seen. His design shows through. Just one thing to think of, about. We have a record of Doubting Thomas. No doubt you will hear of Doubting Thomas who doubted that the Lord Jesus had been raised from the dead if you want to look this up in your Bibles it's John chapter 20 verse 24 <coughs> but Thomas one of the twelve called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came so the other disciples were saying to him we have seen the Lord but he said unto them unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side I will not believe and after eight days his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them and Jesus came the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said peace be with you then he said to Thomas reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving but believing Thomas answered and said to him my Lord and my God Jesus said to him because you have seen me you have have you believed blessed are they who do not see and yet believed and then the reason for the gospel of John being written we have the le next two verses in verse 30 therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name and that is the reason why it is so important for us to believe in a God that I cannot see because there is a hope of life there is going to be a kingdom that was predicted by Daniel set up on this world and if we believe and trust in the Lord God we can have a hope of life of living in that kingdom thank you for listening